Hi everyone, this is Joanne Martonic with RBSF. Thank you for joining our webinar, How Digital Marketing Has Helped States Achieve R3 Success. Before we get started, I have just a few housekeeping items to go over before we have our pre presenters. All phones will be kept on mute throughout the duration of the webinar. We will have a question and answer session at the end of the presentations, and you can ask the question at that time by typing it in the Q&A box on the right side of your screen. If you don't see the Q&A box, you might need to expand the settings by clicking the little red arrow at the top right of the screen. If you have a question during the webinar, feel free to write it into the Q&A box, and we'll read it out loud at the end um, and address it with the group. A copy of the slides along with the recording of today's presentation will be posted to the website following the webinar, and I'll send out an email to all attendees when the materials are available for download. Before exiting the webinar, please take the time to fill out a survey that you'll see pop up at the end. These questions will help us plan future webinars and assess how we can better assist you in your marketing efforts. We really appreciate, appreciate your feedback on today's webinar. Thank you again for joining us. We will have three short presentations today, followed by time for Q&A. The Massachusetts Division of Fisheries and Wildlife has been engaged in digital marketing since 2017. Last year, they set out to engage with a new audience by reaching out to people with an interest in camping. The positive results of their campaign include increased awareness in fishing, new partnerships, license sales, and new ideas for the future. Mass Wildlife Communication Corner Coordinator Emily Strolarski will present an overview of the camping crossover campaign. All right, Emily. Well, thanks, Joanne. Um, so I'm glad to be here today uh, presenting uh, insights from our 2019 spring fishing campaign. Um, as Joanne mentioned, we have been doing some form of digital marketing for several years now. Uh, each year we maintain the most successful portions of the previous year's campaign. And then we try to branch out and explore new possibilities for new audiences uh, or outreach methods. Next slide. So I only have 15 minutes today, but I'll try to briefly cover all the elements of the campaign. I'm gonna start with a little background, then delve right into campaign development, audience and ad platforms, and then wrap up by highlighting our results and the lessons learned. Next slide. Uh, so last year, as in other years, the bulk of our campaign focused on retention and reactivation of anglers through, through social media and Google ads, um, as well as through emails and postcards. The goal of the retention and reactivation campaigns is to drive sales. But we also focused some of our digital ads on recruitment. So um, with funding from an RBFF grant, we expanded on this recruitment campaign to target people who had an interest in camping. The goal of all the recruitment campaigns is to raise awareness and interest in fishing. Next slide. So why camping? Well, if we look at the current uh, research, it shows that camping, not surprisingly, is a top outdoor crossover activity to fishing. About a quarter of all fishing trips are part of a larger event like camping or hiking. And nearly all, uh, excuse me, near, nearly half of all campers say that fishing is one of their favorite leisure activities. Next. So campaign development. As in previous years, we hired a marketing firm in 2019 to assist with campaign development and ad placement. For this portion of the campaign, we partnered with the Co Department of Conservation and Recreation, which is the agency that runs state parks in Massachusetts. We also worked with our own fisheries staff to generate a list of 10 great campgrounds that also have great fishing nearby. Um, locations were selected from all across the state with special attention on locations that were easily accessible from our major population centers. Uh, DCR facilitated special access for our staff to visit the sites to collect appealing photographs of water body, excuse me, water bodies near camping areas. Um, and with that content, we created landing pages featuring photographs 
and descriptions of these locations, which will be on the next slide. Next. So here's a screenshot of what that landing page looked like. It's kind of hard to capture on a slide because it's a long page that requires you to scroll down to get to the top 10 uh, locations. The copy on these pages is tailored to individuals who have an interest in camping and fishing and provides a unique set of details about these locations that aren't found anywhere else on the web. These pages served as the foundation to all our crossover promotions. They contain details about the camping and fishing opportunities, but also had frequent reminders to purchase a license. Next. So with that top 10 content in place, we focused on ad types and target audiences. We used Google Display and social media in addition to Google Search for this campaign. And we feel that these ad platforms worked well together. Um, Google Display and social ads increase interest and can generate searches. So if a visual ad prompts a search, our Google Search ads are in place and tailored to move customers even further along in the process. Next. Our campaign ran from June 17th to July 21st, and all the digital campaigns drove traffic to that top 10 uh, landing pages that I mentioned earlier. The campaign goal is to increase awareness and interest in fishing. And now we'll take a closer look at the audiences and content for each ad platform. Next. <coughs> So we'll start with social media. Uh, working with our marketing firm, we identified three target audiences and ran a series of camping and fishing ads on Facebook and Instagram to drive traffic to that top 10 fishing uh, and camping site webpage. Uh, each audience segment received ads that were specifically tailored for that group. Next. The first uh, audience was Massachusetts Outdoor Generalists defined as folks over 25 that lived in Massachusetts. Uh, people in this audience included those who mass matched interest in outdoor recreation, backpacking, wilderness, REI, camping, and so on. Next. We tested four ads for this audience segment, and because this was our most general audience, the copy focused on the diversity and range of campsites throughout the state to appeal to a wide range of audiences. Uh, the imagery was varied. As you can see, uh, lots of lovely photos of waterfronts. One showed a tent. Next. Um, photos of uh, somebody fishing from a boat, and just other eye-catching uh, waterfront scenes. Next. Massachusetts Outdoor Families, that was our next audience group, were folks 30 to 50 years old who lived in Massachusetts. These were people who are, had interest in outdoors and camping, but were also likely parents of young, uh, young kids. Next. So we tested four ads for this audience. Uh, the copy and imagery was focused on families spending time together. We also included some elements to elicit nostalgia in parents, like s'mores and campfires. Next. Uh, one of our ads also highlighted camping as, and fishing as a low-cost option for family uh, vacations. Next. And our last audience is Boston Young Adults. This included people between 30, uh, excuse me, 23 and 40, who live in Boston area zip codes. People in this audience matched interests in hiking, nature, outdoor recreation. Next. Um, we specifically highlighted those properties from our list that were within an hour drive from the city. We tested three ad variations for this audience. The copy was focused on escaping uh, the busy city, unplugging, and reconnecting with nature. Next. So we also used Google Display Ads. Display ads are text or images that appear when you're on Google or other websites in the Google Display Network. Display ads capture someone's attention 
early in the buying process. Um, our audience for this platform consisted of mass residents with an interest in camping and outdoor recreation. Next, yeah. Um, so to create these ads, Google arranges your content using uh, snippets of what you enter into a variety of different ads that are shown at various sizes. Some include imagery, some um, include an RCL, and some were just text-based. Next. On to Google Search. So unlike the social media ads and display ads, search ads are designed for people who already have an interest in camping and who are actively searching. Paid search ads appear at the top of the page based on the keywords that a person is looking for. We limited our audience to people searching within Massachusetts. The copy of the search ads focused on escaping the nature, getting outside and enjoying fishing and camping, and promoting that top 10 campsite list. Next. Developing a good keyword list is vital uh, to a successful search campaign. We worked closely with our marketing firm and used Google's keyword planner tool to, the, to develop our list. Throughout the campaign, we monitored the performance of those keywords and regularly made adjustments to the list. And just a word of caution here, um, your cost per click can get, uh, get high if you venture into topics with a lot of competition. In this case, there might be competition from retailers um, looking to promote gear. So to make sure that we were efficient with our ad spend, and to avoid showing ads to people who are actually looking for gear, we created a list of negative keywords. And that negative keywords um, included things like buying a tent, camping gear, and so on. Next. And now on to results. And next again. So starting with the results from Facebook and Instagram, uh, these figures come from Facebook's ad dashboard. Uh, our social media ads were shown over one and a half million times to nearly 700,000 people. Overall, our Facebook ads exceeded industry benchmarks with an average click-through rate of 1.8%. Uh, that's compared to an average click-through rate across all industries of 0.9%. Um, in addition to those results, uh, comments that we received on those social media ads for camping and fishing were overwhelmingly positive with many people commenting that they were, you know, excited to take take trips to some of these locations that we are promoting. Next. Uh, on to Google search. Uh, the 74,000 impressions and 4,300 clicks indicated that we were able to drive awareness in fishing with our search campaign. Again, the search campaign exceeded industry, industry benchmarks with an average click-through rate of 5.7% compared with that, an, an average of 1.9%. Um, next. Our Google Display uh, campaign was effective in driving interest and awareness of fishing and camping with high impressions and link clicks. And again, um, there's not a super high um, expectation for click-through rate, but we were we were well above the industry average with 0.89% uh, and and industry average is 0.35. Uh, excuse me, across all industries. Uh, next. So in addition to those results, we were able to look at some engagement metrics such as time spent on page. So we were really surprised to see that users spent a lot of time on our landing pages. It was a little bit risky sending people to this long form content given the majority of uh, readers uh, short attention spans. Uh, but as you can see, um, you know, five to, to seven minutes average uh, time spent on page for a comparison people spent an average of about two minutes on all of our other mass wildlife web pages. So that was a that was a great um, success for us. Next. So in addition to driving interest and awareness, the the crossover effort generated license sales. Um, 
in order to accurately report those licensed sales, we rely on a pixel to track direct sales as well as sales over a period of time after um, a user interacts with one of our ads. But during our campaign, um, our licensed vendor made a change that ended up disabling our tracking abilities for over half the campaign. So the numbers you see there are likely a very low estimate of our licensed sales. Um, definitely frustrating, but important also to remember that licensed sales were not a major campaign goal. Um, so in addition to our paid ads, we gained a lot of exposure through press releases and through our mon monthly newsletter. The goal was uh, for these unpaid efforts to reinforce our paid campaign. For example, if someone saw a news story about top 10 places to camp and fish, it might lead them to do a search to learn more, and at this point, um, they would hopefully be served one of our ads that would be customized with a message to drive more traffic to our website and um, get folks even more excited about the content. Thanks to our press release, um, our top 10 list received a good amount of press coverage from a variety of news outlets, including the Boston Globe and Boston.com. In total, these articles had a uh, print and online circulation of at least 3.3 million. Next. I just wanted to also point out another um, non-paid uh, portion of this campaign um, that was kind of a, a happy, you know, a happy result. We didn't set out initially to, to get this, but through our partnership with the Department of Conservation and Recreation, a banner was added to all Massachusetts campsite web pages on the Reserve America platform that was promoting the top 10 list. Um, Reserve America is used by all customers who want to make a reservation at a state campsite. Um, we are also able to work with the Department of Tourism to promote that top 10 list as well. And next slide. So that's a kind of breakneck speed. Uh, Camping crossover campaign in a in a nutshell. Um, you know, we we thought it was a great success. We had planned to take some of our learnings and um, you know create more curated lists and actually even to to reach out to non-residents with an interest in camping this year. Uh, but obviously, with the COVID situation, that has kind of you know had to take a back burner. And I think that we'll take that up when it's a more normal year. Um, but we have taken steps to de deepen our partnership with DCR and have plans to increase our visual presence on the camping reservation website. So um, that's, that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emily. Really appreciate that. Um, again, if you have any questions for Emily, please go ahead and put them in the Q&A box on the right side of your screen, and um, she will answer them at the end of the webinar. So next, um, we have Jennifer Weichel, Marketing Coordinator with the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources. Jennifer has been with the Minnesota DNR Marketing from their formal start in 2013. Each year, Jennifer works to build new sustainable efforts in Minnesota's fish and wildlife license promotions. Today, she'll be covering the outcomes of their most recent digital campaign that was co-branded with Takeaway Fishing that showed positive return on investment, paying over and above their campaign investment. All right, I'll now turn it over to Jennifer. Thanks, Joanne. Hi, everybody. Um, welcome from uh, the state of Minnesota. As I sit in my home office, as I, I'm guessing many of you are doing as well, um, I hope the weather outside is encouraging you to get out. Um, the weather has been really great here in Minnesota. So thanks for today. Um, I am going to cover how we continually improve our efforts from year to year in our marketing. Um, I so appreciate how Emily uh, talked about that as well, how they continue to grow their efforts and look at what works, um, continue with that, and then uh, move forward with those things and adjust other things that may not be working well. 
So I'm going to talk about how Minnesota has used um, the strategy of visibility, leverage, and looking at profits to pay for our campaigns, the return on our investments. And that looks like visibility to our customers, how we're increasing visibility to our customers, how we're leveraging partnerships, and then again, how we're tracking our profits. Minnesota is always considering how we work within the outdoor recreation adoption model or the ORAM as many of us um, refer to it as. So where are we growing our digital visibility? Where are we leveraging partnerships as I mentioned? And then also just where are we coming alongside a customer's journey in the transactions from their awareness and interest, their consideration and purchase, their retention and advocacy? How are we enhancing their discovery? How are we putting inputs to engage and educate them? And how are we then helping them in their transaction and supporting them in their next um, efforts to become advocates for us? So pa this past year in 2019, spring of 2019, um, Minnesota coordinated with Take Me Fishing and their Making Waves campaign to co-brand a campaign using RBFF's Take Me Fishing um, assets along with crossover with Minnesota assets. We started that effort by defining our market. Uh, we shared data between the um, vendor, Cole McVoy, and RBFF. We shared our campaign objectives, our campaign desires, the abilities and the implementation strategies that we can do here in Minnesota. And we also looked at our customer analysis by looking at the RBFF market segment study and along with our Minnesota data that we know about our customers. So this effort, we target the outdoor enthusi enthusiasts, or what are now called the active social, for targeting retention and reactivation. If you're not familiar with the RBFF market study, segment study, you can go on their website and learn more about that. So next, we set up our marketing tactics. So we, as similar to Massachusetts, use some marketing tactics um, that are most common. We used a paid search, a Google paid search, and that's where your ads pop up in the search uh, based on some keywords. We did some digital banner displays on target market websites with audience interests. We had some paid Facebook ads and an email strategy. So this slide lays out our timing, which was May and June of 2019. And there in that box on the top, the, um, the amount that was spent for each tactic and under each example is shown there. So our marketing budget was $50,000 for the actual tactics. And then we did spend $10,000 on the creatives that you are seeing examples there on the page with using Minnesota photos, with using Take Me Fishing assets, um, and also building out with a shared logos. Here are some additional examples of those co-branded assets. Here again, an example of a social media um, campaign image, more examples of the ads that pop up. Um, one thing we did learn from, I believe this was actually Massachusetts as well, from a previous effort that they had done, adding the word official to the Minnesota online licensing, the word official can help separate you um, with, from some of the fake sites that have been popping up across the nation. So that's just a tidbit and a suggestion to those of you that are working with your vendors that um, that be added to your to your campaign. Um, the bottom one is an example of the display ads. Um, 
that similar to how Massachusetts talked about, um, pop up on various websites based on um, interests of those audiences. And here again are some more of those examples um, of co-branded efforts. We worked also with um, our vendor. Our, our emails are sent out through a um, partnership with our license um, licensing vendor, Aspira. And so the example there on the far right is a template that we worked with our vendor and our BFF to create. It's a simplified email to what we have done in the past. And that email was sent out through our ELS vendor. We also um, rented or paid for outside um, email lists, which I'll talk more about as well, but we had some really positive outcomes from that layout. So, we had one, um, well, the overall campaign was a success in all of the efforts that we were looking at tracking. Um, as I mentioned, we spent $60,000 total with 50,000 of that being on the, on the tactics themselves, 10,000 on the display um, creation or ad creation. And just one of our digital tactics, the paid search, um, gave us a 321,000 return on investment. And so that effort just alone outweighed our spend on the campaign. We also looked at year over year of our online license sales, and that increase during this time frame was $1.6 million. So we increased and drove more traffic to our online sales. And we did not track um, our Facebook social uh, campaigns. Um, we did not add a, a tracker on that. So I don't have outcomes specifically for that. Next slide. So the overall, um, our media assets are exceeded industry benchmarks similar to Massachusetts, which is really fantastic that we are um, overall starting to see that our um, campaigns are driving interest and, and driving activity. Overall, we had 6 million impressions and 65,000 clicks to our website because of the campaign. As noted, the paid search brought in 321,000. We also had just shy of 7,000 licensed sales directly connected to the co-branded display ads, which if we do it on the back of the napkin kind of comparison or calculations, that could be estimated at $115,000. So again, above the investment that we spent. Our social efforts um, engaged with likes and shares and comments had just over 10,000 people engaging in that. As I mentioned, we did not track revenue from those Facebook um, efforts. And then finally, we did pay for an outside email list to reach potentially new customers, which I mentioned. We did not track that um, back to our back to revenue. Um, so I don't have outcomes from that either, but we spent 6,500 on that investment. Next slide. So again, here is just a summary of the outputs of those investments. Again, it was over a two month time period. Our fishing opener in Minnesota is in May. Our opener is uh, qualified as our walleye and Northern Pike and bass seasons opening up. So May is a big push for us to put out um, promotions and efforts to get people into license sales. So again, the paid search brought back uh, um, over $300,000. Um, we estimated that the um, digital displays brought in 7,000 license sales. And as I mentioned, do doing the back of the napkin, that could have been of $115,000. And we had just shy of 10,000 people engaged in our social media, which again is really great to elevate our um, information and our brand in front of our customers and potential new customers. Next slide. 
Additionally, um, I talked about that we did a email campaign that um, we paid for a paid for a target audience list to send emails out to. And that did have almost um, 53,000 opens and a click through rate of 2.2. .2. And we did that twice. We did that effort twice. Um, and that one, again, we did not track back to actual revenue, but we could um, have added that to our campaign or it could be a suggestion added effort to your campaign to be able to track back. Next slide. So our um, our in-house tactics, this was our no cost to us. This is just in partnership with our ELS vendor, Aspira. So there were no costs associated with this, but we still got great outcomes on efforts that we do on a pretty regular basis through our ELS vendor. So we continue to send retention and reactivation emails. That's a three-year look back from the, um, people that had been engaged in fishing or small game. Small game includes fishing in our license layout. So we send email reminders to those customers, those that have emails in our system. We started collecting emails back in 2010, um, and we are increasing those numbers of um, emails year to year but we only have about 25% of our customers currently in our system that have emails. So we're also looking at ways to increase that. But these are sent to retention and react or meant for retention and reactivation of our past customers over the past three years. And year over year, that can our campaign showed the increase of online sales by 49%, or as I mentioned earlier, $1.6 million. We also had a 13.5% increase in returning or lapsed customers and again our online sale increases. So again this did not cost us anything. This is just in partnership with our our licensing vendor. They send the emails out for us. I work in coordination with them to um, structure those emails and put together the content that goes within those emails. But this email layout that we did change up this year um, I think really did engage people a lot more. It's a lot more visual, simplified um, with some key content and some key links to information. So the biggest behind the scenes that happens for us to be able to see whether or not these things are bringing us a return on our investment is the use of pixels. Pixels, cookies, tracking code, um, you may hear them in different terms, but this was the first year that Minnesota was allowed to use pixels just based on um, some legal and statutory authorities that we have um, sideboards on. So this tracking code is not always an easy thing to do, and it does take some effort. There's layers with um, working with your ELS vendor, working with your uh, media vendor, and then we also had our DNR um, information technology partners to have to um, place code on our websites as well. So it took a lot initially to organize that. However, um, we were able to embed the tracking pixels to, um, to match the various click rates and uh, click throughs and then click throughs to actual purchases um, at the end of a purchase. So legal ease is we did have to add some new language to our website policies so people understood or could look for whether or not or, or understand what our tracking policies are. We are the only um, division within our organization that's currently allowed to do this type of a tracking as it is meant to be currently a pilot effort. Um, however, we are doing this again this year, and so we'll see how those outcomes. And not everything is perfect, as um, Emily mentioned in her site, you know, some things can change on the licensing side, or something can tweak on your homepage or your website, um, agency website, which could actually cut the, the string between your linking uh, to track those pixels. So some things that kind of happened with us too, 
um, but just just know that we're you know this is a continuing ev evolution. Next slide. So again, just reviewing the overview that um, we're always looking again. How do we how do we um, enhance discovery when people are in that awareness and interest that customer is looking for or is um, looking for things to do so an awareness and an interest so building that visibility is great for digital content for digital marketing efforts um, it can be quick it can be tracked you can do a b testing to see how well one picture or one um, ad is doing over another and you can flip that up really pretty quickly leveraging partnerships is always something that is um, advanced advantageous to us here in Minnesota. So we can build our efforts with um, cross promotion when folks are looking for consideration and purchasing in hunting and fishing, um, things like working with our tourism associ association, things working like this national partnership with RBFF and the Take Me Fishing campaign. So we can build the engagement and educate our customers, again, through a very um, digitally driven opportunity and finally, this great opportunity to add pixels um, so that we could truly track our return on, impro return on investment and understand our profits on our efforts. And that, with that, that is um, where I will wrap it up. Look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Um, Jennifer was nice enough to put together a little bit of a cheat sheet on her campaign, and um, you can find it in the handout section on the right side of your screen. I will also include that in um, the email when I let you all know that the recording of the webinar is online. Um, so thank you again. Thank you again, Jennifer. Um, we'll now hear from Jennifer Wisniewski, the Chief of Outreach and Communications for the Tennessee Wildlife Resources Agency and current president of the Association for Conservation Information. She has worked actively over the last few years to bring marketing to the forefront of what agencies do to make a difference in our three efforts and to also keep agencies relevant in the public at large. And I'll turn it over to Jennifer. Well, hey, everybody. I've always said it's really hard to do these webinars because you can't see people's faces. Nobody can laugh at your jokes. Um, and, you know, there's not that audience response, but I'm picturing you all uh, in my kitchen as we go through this. So um, we wanted to, with an R3 grant, um, try to put some um, return on investment in some of this uh, outreach that we do as an agency if you guys go to different fairs or festivals or anything like that uh, you know it's it's you've got a great audience there to speak to but you don't necessarily get a return on the investment that your agency's making so here is my stab at um, putting some return on investment in the way of license sales to that next slide so um and it says grants due now for 2020 that was back in february but um we got um an r3 grant to add to our already fairly robust marketing budget that we placed through our license vendor brand great partnership there but um we wanted to try something a little different and do geofencing um so what's a geofence go to the next one oh so here's the budget up close so we had a little bit of money to create ads um, most of the money for ad placement and a little bit for booth rental at Nashville Farmers Market. Next. So what's a geofence? So when you walk into a geofence location, which is just an invisible fence that your big brother cell phone puts on you when you are walking around, uh, then the uh, GPS technology captures the device ID of the user and then can um, follow you around with ads. So when you walk into something as small as a building, like you could geofence a sporting goods store, you could geofence um, a large outdoor event, or you could geofence like several folks, uh, geofence iCast. Um, so that's kind of the idea of geofencing. And then you serve up those people that were at that location ads based on the fact that they were at that location. And they don't, a person doesn't know that they're receiving an ad because they were at a certain location. Next. 
All right, so what the agency did, then we tried two different kinds of events. One was the Nashville Farmers Market um, and one was the Wilderness Wildlife Festival. Next. So the Nashville Farmers Market, it's this huge farmers market in downtown Nashville that um, attracts about 10,000 people each year. And uh, we were kind of working that foodie angle, talking about locally sourced food, and you can go catch your own local source protein right down the street and kind of gave away some fishing 101 advice. And uh, you see, I made it a family affair down there. That's my little girl and my husband. And we just had fun giving away a bunch of fried catfish every Saturday. Um, and uh, that's what we did there. So yeah, next. And then we did the Wilderness Wildlife Festival. So this is kind of that general um, wildlife event that outdoorsy people, mainly photographers and artists and hikers go to. This is not a hunting and a fishing event. This is a um, just literally a wildlife festival that um, people that are interested in um, uh, wildlife in general come there. and. Um, we, we, our goal there was trying to get them to purchase a license to support wildlife. And so we had an informational booth there and it was over in East Tennessee. So a lot of it was about don't feed the bears, but we tried to give that message of, hey, you know, the best way that you can support wildlife in the state of Tennessee is purchasing a license. Next. All right, so that was what the agency did. And then we also placed ads and we had a custom ad built for each of the two events. So you see them there and it, th these were served up to people that were at either of those places for the 30 days following the event. And the ads were only showed to people that did not have um, an account with us. So that, that it would be a new customer that we'd never had before, or they were lapsed for longer than 18 months, which is kind of our sweet spot for, okay, you've been out of it for like two years now, let's get you back. Um, so these are the two ads, just hit next. First one for the Nashville Farmers Market. So this one served up 1.1 million impressions. We had over 6,000 conversions, 6,500 conversions. Um, the click-through revenue on that ad was a little over $200,000 and we spent $8,700 to get that $200,000. So we made $23 on every dollar we spent for ad placement. So yay, success. Next. And this one was my really my favorite because so for the wilderness wildlife festivals and these are people that do not buy licenses but we said hey every license sold helps wildlife conservation and these are the people that we want to be relevant to as an agency so anyway for the wilderness wildlife festival we got almost 300,000 impressions and 2300 people converted to buying licenses and that made us $51,000 and we only spent $2,000 to get it so again it's a great return on ad spend Next. So results and next steps with um, the wildlife and sport fish restoration fund money, the total return from this whole little experiment to the agency was $335,000. And the total money invested was $12,850. And we recruited or reactivated almost 9,000 people. So I, I was really pleased with this R3 grant from RBFF. Um, you know, we do do a lot of other digital ads and marketing, and um, I like to experiment with new things, but it's, it's hard to decide to take money away from something that you know is working and reinvest it in trying something different. So thanks RBFF for offering us these R3 grants so that we can uh, try new things and prove them before we uh, go too far down the road. And next. So yeah, you can see the total numbers there. Keep going. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna keep geofencing to accomplish R3 and using targeted messages and add more expos and farmers markets. And uh, unfortunately that hasn't worked out so well this year because of COVID, but we still are doing uh, other geofence things that I'll talk about a little bit. Um, and you don't have to have a booth to be effective. So, um, even on, so we continued on at the Nashville Farmer's Market doing some ads there, even on days that we weren't there giving away fish and talking to people. 
and the ads were really just as effective. So <laughs> even if you don't have a booth at an event, you could geofence that event at, or that location and be very effective. Next. So we are doing uh, boat ramps and marinas now. Um, and um, WMA is another public land. So we have CWD in uh, certain parts of our state and we geofence those WMAs to serve up ads about CWD reporting so that people that are hunting on those WMAs know that they need to follow the rules for CWD. Um, we are we just started geofencing boat ramps and marinas, so we don't really know results from that yet, but um, that's with another grant through RBFF, so thanks for that. And we're doing new community fishing lakes. So we're stocking a couple of urban fisheries um, at like these fun city parks and we're gonna, um, this will start June 1st. Um, we're going to, so stock those lakes, put up some signage about, hey, go fishing, get your license. And uh, we'll geofence the five mile radius of that community fishing lake to try to pull people that are lapsed or um, new customers to convince them to go fishing um, nearby. And that's kind of what we're doing. been really impressed with the geofencing strategies. And I, th I think there's a lot of ways that we can target people based on where they've been and what they've been doing. So yeah, that's it. Thanks, Joanne. Great, thanks, Jennifer. Sorry sorry for skipping ahead on that, that last slide. Yes. Um, all right, thank you to all three presenters, to Emily, Jennifer, and Jennifer. Um, we will now answer some questions. Um, so if you have questions, please put them into the questions and answers box and we will read them out loud. We've received a few already. Um, the first one, the first one is for Emily. Um, this question is from Kristen. She asks, why do you think your campaign exceeded industry benchmarks across the board? Emily, are you there? Yeah, I was just trying to remember how to unmute. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, I want to start off. I was I was kind of kicking myself because I I think I kept saying industry benchmarks. We don't have um, like outdoor recreation industry benchmarks. It's across all industries. We're not able to get that detailed. Um, so it's kind of hard to you know compare yourself, um, you know, to to that broad of an audience, but. Um, really, I mean, I think that what must be happening is, um, y you know, I think that we always, um, when we select an audience, um, we're really careful to, um, you know, write, revise, fine tune our messaging that will actually speak to that audience. We, um, you know, have learned that the more targeted you can be and kind of imagining what kind of messaging will um, speak to an audience, um, it goes a long way. So instead of just, you know, cookie cutter, um, you know, taglines for each audience, you know, they're targeted. And then, um, you know, we try new things and kind of tinker with the, you know, the messaging throughout the campaign. So, I mean, especially, um, you know, Google search, you're able to do that really easily. So instead of just saying, you know, we're going to push play on this campaign and just let it run for, you know, eight weeks or something, it's kind of a weekly check-in um, to make sure that keywords are performing, um, eliminating those that aren't, and, you know, making those adjustments. And, and that's that's one of the really big things that, that we've learned is that it's it's not just about like putting it all all the effort in up front. It's kind of tweaking things along the way. So I think that's a result of of that kind of attention to detail and and um, you know aligning your messaging with with the audiences. At least that's what we'd like to to hope is happening. That's great. Thanks. Yeah, I think keeping an eye on um, how things are running and resonating is is really important. Um, the next question is also for you, Emily. Um, it is curious if you worked with internal or contract photographers for Mass Wildlife. Do you coordinate details and logistics ahead of time? 
the canoe angler was right on time. The, the I'm sorry, I've missed the last part of that. Oh, it was just a little side comment that he said the canoe angler was right on time. And the canoe, one of the canoeing pictures you had. Oh. The, just the. Um, you know, we um, for the for the camping uh campaign we just uh sent actually some folks on our staff who are good photographers um and since we had to kind of divide and conquer the the state um i believe there were three people that we sent out and you know uh just happened to get some some really great uh photographs we uh, mass wildlife used to have a phenomenal um staff photographer um, who was with the agency for 30 years, but um, he passed away a couple of years ago, sadly. But, you know, we've had to just kind of pull resources because we don't have, a, you know, a, a budget to, to do that. So we were just lucky enough to have some, you know, some some folks with a side hobby of, of photography and just taking advantage of that. Great, thanks. Um, and at RBSF, we, ha we do a photo shoot um, once in a while. and um, we do normally hire a photographer, but we also um, we plan it ahead. We you know we know what pictures we kind of want, whether or not it's canoe or kayak or um, fishing from the shore, fishing from a boat, and so we kind of have a shot list going into it. Um, and we did the same thing. We had a internal day where we went to get um, some some staff members went to get some pictures, and for that we were just taking pictures on. Um, our cell phones, but we had a list of things and videos we wanted to get ahead of time. So I think that does help to plan it out ahead of time. Um, the next question, well, I guess would be for all three, um, and this might uh, be easier in a follow-up email, but the question is, can you share the words you used for your page search? Um, if it's easier, I can have, if, if you guys wouldn't mind sharing the, the keywords you used in an email, I can then send it on to the person asking the question or anybody who's curious. Yeah, I think that would be um, an easier way to handle that. And um, Joanne, you would have that from Cole McBoy, but the also, yeah. um, I really do appreciate how Emily also pointed out the negative key search words that you want to try and stay clear of or think about so you're not competing. And that's actually what RBFF is doing this year with their Take Me Fishing campaign and asking the agencies um, not to overspend on their, on, so we're not competing against each other on those types of things. Right, great, thanks. Um, yeah, so we'll, I'll pull the list together and send it um, on to Gina. And if anyone else has wants to that information as well, please let me know. Um, the next question is for Jennifer Weichel. Um, great job may i ask why did you skip a week of facebook ads in the middle of that digital ad calendar um so we had identified um our market spender how much we wanted to spend on that and then we were testing doing a little bit of testing of different images um while doing that as well so it was just more of a regroup period than anything um, and then we were sharing, we continued to, sh to cross share um, those social um, uh, campaign images across our agency, different social media pages. So um, there wasn't maybe the effort to, to put in during those times, but um, it was more just a, a touch base time. Okay, great. Um, let's see. The next question. Oh, sorry. It's for this is for Jennifer Wisniewski. Um, do you use a particular vendor for the geofencing strategies? Yeah, so we use our licensed vendor Brant to do all of our place marketing for us. Great. Um, so your licensed vendor, they do the um, geofencing ads as well. Is that what you said? Yeah. So Brant does places all of our marketing for us. Great, thanks. Um, 
The next question is for you as well. Is that how do you determine if people already have a TWRA account when they enter the geofence? Sure. So there's exclusion lists that you can provide. Um, so they, the marketing system is hooked up to our sales system. So um, they know whether the personal information that they put in um, is linked with their email address and other things. Um, phone numbers are, um, we know who to exclude from those lists. So if you already have a license, you're excluded. Um, and if you don't have a license, we know to include you. And uh, we also use the inclusion lists for longer term lapse. Okay, great. Um, next question is also for you, is who staffed the events at the farmer's market and wildlife days? Um, it was me and my staff that did the Nashville farmer's market. I didn't get a whole lot of people that wanted to volunteer their Saturdays in May. So I just took the fisheries divisions prior and went and bought some catfish from a commercial cat fisherman that uh, harvested the fish um, out of the reservoir nearby and uh, I did it with my folks. So there were just three or four of us there. Um, for the Wilderness Wildlife Festival, that's a long standing festival that we put people at for, oh, probably 15 or 20 years. Um, and that's regional staff. There's an officer or two and our outreach coordinator in that region of the state that go. Gotcha, great, thanks. Um, the next question is for all three of you. Um, what campaigns are you planning for the summer with COVID going on? Jennifer Weichel, do you want to go first? Yeah, I can jump in. So um, in Minnesota, we're actually we actually were given a RBFF R3 grant because I listened to Jennifer Winzinski's program um, at the marketing and, and she was kind enough to share her grant proposal. So I quickly wrote a grant proposal the day I returned from that marketing. So we're actually doing a geofence this year. Um, not not on an event based, obviously, because our event that we were going to geofence was canceled, but we still are using a vendor that can geofence actual homes based on the audience um, likes of those um, homes. So it's it's a similar idea, but they're at, we're actually targeting them in their home versus them going to a place. And we're targeting them based on um, their likes. So we too are doing on a, a, a foodie type based thing on um, getting your protein local and on the idea of um, doing activities close to home. And rolled into that, then we have a partnership with an influencer here in Minnesota. Her name is Laura Shera. Her father, Ron Shera, is big in the um, hunting and fishing realm here in Minnesota, at least. And we are using her as an influence and started a whole web campaign and social campaign um, called Get It Local, which has recipes and um, places close to home that, or you know, a, a search finder that can find them places to go fishing close to home, um, information on how to fish, information on how to hunt as well, because we're because I cross over both hunting and fishing, and then we are relaunching the paid search um, again. So when people are searching for their license or searching for fishing in Minnesota, that we're the top ad that comes up. Awesome, that's interesting. Great. Jennifer Wojcicki? Sure. Uh, that's that's really awesome, Jennifer. I love your uh, geofencing homes idea. I might have to steal that one too. Um, but in Tennessee, our license sales are up like over 15%. We're close to $4 million in sales more than we were um, the last year this time during this license year. And, you know, non-resident sales are down, but resident sales are skyrocketing. So, you know, we're trying to take advantage of all these folks that are rediscovering hunting and fishing and encouraging to them to go outside. Um, we're using social influencers some to try to encourage people to go um, stay safe, but go fishing and get outdoors. Um, we've worked with the hunting public on several videos. Um, We've also been, uh, I, I sent out some targeted emails to folks um, telling them how they can get outdoors and what's open and uh, encourage them to renew their license and go outdoors. Um, you know, we've, we've got um, 
the community fishing lakes that are opening. We're still trying to figure out when we can start to do in-person things again, but um, all in all, this COVID thing hadn't been so bad for us. <laughs> yeah. It um, might be those, the best thing for our of... three. It might be the best thing for all <laughs> yeah. three. Now we just gotta figure out how to retain them. No, oh, yeah. Re retention of the new ones, yeah, is definitely going to be an important factor. Um, Emily, do you wanna share your plans for this summer campaigns? Sure. Um, yeah, we've just kind of had to proceed with caution, as you all might know. I mean, Massachusetts is still pretty, um, we're, we're kind of, things are starting to loosen up here. Um, really just plans for that has, have just been announced this week. So um, we've really had to um, kind of pump the brakes on, uh, you know, some of our plans, because like I said, we were really excited about the you know the campaign crossover but and we were going to do you know more targeted lists we had envisioned doing things like great places to fly fish or you know great places to paddle and fish um, but really when you think about it like those are great and you know we had all that success with the media because it's like oh, okay you know your your town made the list kind of thing and if you have a top 10 list but really what that does is kind of concentrates people into a smaller, you know, subset of of water bodies. So we, we just really had to kind of put that on the shelf um, for now. And then, like I said, our other um, idea was we were going to reach out, you know, outside the, the border of Massachusetts to non-residents who might be planning camping trips here as well. And, of course, that <laughs> was derailed, um, you know, so every, uh, everything kind of was, was just, uh, you know, I had to put on hold. Um, and we, like many of you all, are seeing, lot, you know, a, a great boost in, in license sales. So um, we felt comfortable launching search, um, and that, that um, effort is doing great. We decided to kind of even boost our daily uh, spend there. Uh, to take advantage of the interest that's out there from, you know, people who are coming back to us or maybe just kind of looking for something to do. So we're trying to kind of meet people where they are. We're trying to be careful about our messaging um, instead of like, you know, have a great day on the water with your friends. It's a little bit more, we've just kind of like retooled everything to be like, you know, um, relax, get, you know, escape, uh, into nature and kind of like a little bit more yeah. of a peaceful solo kind of uh, messaging. So, but we are going to start with some more, um, you know, of our more visual social ads now that kind of we're feeling a little bit more confident, confident about, you know, doing that outreach in a time where people might be a little wary of us trying to kind of capitalize on their <laughs> home boundness. But um, right, right, things things are things are you know going great. All all things all things uh, considered. Sure. Well, I think we are um, we are actually over on time. So I wanted to thank all three of our presenters again. Um, if any other questions come up, feel free to email um, any of the presenters and I will follow up with everyone once um, the presentation and recording are online. As you leave the webinar, please take the time to fill out the survey. We really appreciate your feedback and it helps us plan um, future webinars. So again, thank you to Emily, Jennifer, and Jennifer, and I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their day. Thank you.